This is fantastic news. I was actually found, discovered the first one I printed in white plastic, the leg didn't go properly, pro pr pr properly. And this is the latest one I've printed and it came out perfectly. I didn't have to stick anything back on. I fiddled with the expert settings a little bit more and it came out beautifully. All the legs intact, the support structure snapped off a treat, the suckers are clear. It's fantastic. So what I'm doing now, and by the way, there's the one, the early one. In fact, I printed this one because I made a little recess in the base so I could put one of those brooch pins in it. I'll do that and then I'll try and possibly get these on the website and Etsy just to see, get some feedback really, see what people like. But whilst I'm waiting, I thought I would print a white one. Now I've got it all sourced out um, because people may well like to paint it their own colours perhaps bright um, copper sort of satin finish isn't to people's taste it might be a good idea to offer a white one which I might have a go at printing as well see how it goes so that's good really pleased about that and also I'm really pleased that this is just going to use the end of this roll up really efficiently without running out I think so that's good here's all the bits so far I'm getting quite frustrated because I'm waiting for clock mechanisms to arrive and I know they've been posted and I'm waiting for the MP3 player for Victoria to arrive and I'm waiting for some other bits of wood and all sorts of stuff to arrive and I am stuck. What I thought I would do is to work on the pendulum. Well, there's the pendulum. If you remember, I've witted on about it, but how I'm just amazed at how clever the mercury compensated pendulum was that basically compensates for um, the pendulum expanding or contracting on weather from the weather and the heat um, and I spent ages when I first put this together trying to work out on earth to simulate mercury because obviously it's a heavy metal it's very toxic and you can't include it in things like this anymore and I tried everything from dipping the bottom of the tube in some silver paint to painting wood to this to that to the other even looking up um, synthetic mercury sort of liquids and things took ages then I discovered that this self adhesive tape the metallic tape the stuff you use to seal conduits or um, air conditioning and things it is brilliant now, I forgot all about this and I'm sort of slowly coming back to it basically this wrapped round Dowling, wooden dowel, thing, for example, like that. Dowel, once you wrap that round, if you leave a little bit sticking over the top, you're going to, especially if you've sanded a meniscus, a slight radius around the top that Mercury always has, you can then wrap it around the outside and then sort of fold it in over the top, and it looks perfectly. And I do believe that this first one was done like that. I think I can just make out the top where the um, sticky metal foil is just folded over. You wouldn't notice unless you were really looking. But a minute I did that, I thought that is it. Yeah, it is perfect. So there we are, top tip. If you want to simulate mercury in your steampunk machines, this tape is fabulous. Alternatively, I think this is the way it went. I'm certainly hoping so. I ended up getting some 7mm, that's what I ended up needing, acrylic rod, which I have subsequently discovered is, again, as rare as hen's teeth. Why do I always end up needing and relying on parts that you can't get anywhere? No one. So, I've been looking around the house, searching everywhere for any 7mm. I did order some last week from eBay clicked on the 7mm, all OK, and then heard back this morning that they hadn't actually got any in stock. So that's really helpful. I've wasted another week waiting for that. But I must stop wittering on. In the end, I found I had one piece left in the drawer from last year. So pleased. And I think the way I did it is to have sanded, cut it into the right length, sanded the bottom flat, very, very gently sanded the top of it, and then just ran it round on the sanding machine sanding belt to get a slight radius to simulate the meniscus and then I believe I have got a piece of wood with 10 holes in it that these should stick up in that I can then spray with the um, silver spray the metallic silver spray because that is so shiny it's the one that I used 
for these bearings if you remember and it really is extremely shiny and does really look like mercury so there we are another top tip if you haven't got any of that metallic tape then this plastic coat silver paint will work a treat but you just need to make sure that what you're spraying it on is really smooth I will now finish sanding down these because I'm still at a loose end because I can't finish the chronographs and I can't get on with the sound with Victoria because I'm waiting for stuff to arrive I thought well, I've got to be doing something and I thought I might try and have another go at this project now, this years ago well yeah it was it must be about two or three years ago I came up with the idea of having a clock that I called a reciprocating chronometer because Try and get that pendulum out of the way so it's not quite so confusing. The way it works, and it has worked extremely well, it has a clock motor, uh, clock movement there that does the seconds, and onto that, and it's probably easier to show you on the transparent one, there is a snail cam. You can see the snail cam mounted to the hour hand, and as that goes round, it lifts up this crank. Well, uh, follower sorry follower and if you can see as that lifts up you can see what happens basically this has a rack and pinion I suppose no he's a gear actually this has a gear that transfers it and moves this bit this bit then moves the hand and it works really well they both of these I mean this is a another development to try and get it to work because there are issues with it does my head in. What I found very early on was that there's a lot of slack in these laser cut gears you, you just really can't help it with the tolerances that I worked to. If you had the teeth much finer they'd be weaker and the tolerances to get it all aligned would be very very difficult. So it's just one of those things you've got to live with. What I realised was I needed to have constant force pulling this pointer down so that the follower on the snail cam is always pushed down. It means that all these are under that, you know, that's pushing that way, that's pushing against that, that's pushing against that, that's pushing against it. So there's no slack. I tried it originally, spent ages, because I'm really relying on gravity alone to do all the moving. So with all sorts of balances and things and this and that, I hoped it would work, but it didn't. It would get to the middle and then it would suddenly flop forward and you'd lose now or something so with this version I tried having a, a little a chain around the middle with a lead weight that constantly keeps this pulled this way that worked but for packaging I don't know I something just uh, I wasn't really happy with it so this version which I never got around to painting as you can see this version works in a pretty similar way but this time on the back it has a gear turning another gear with a lead weight on it so as you can see as this moves backwards and forwards this lead weight is always being pulled down and keeping it um, tight it's, it's one of those things you get involved in this you think right I've got to get this sorted out I need to work on this problem getting it always pulling to the left taking up the tension and you just by this time I've got another bit of acrylic cut out two more gears more this more that absolutely ridiculous so I am erring on the side of this but oh, what reminded me of all this is because while I was looking for the 7mm dowel I found uh, Ernie Ball custom gauge 8 number 8 electric or acoustic guitar string and I've used this very 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 fine steel wire sprung steel for um, springs making it's really good for springs if you want a very very fine spring it's perfect for it and what I keep looking for because the other way of solving this problem would be to have a coil spring a flat coil spring in the middle so it's always keeping it trying to pull it back round to the left I experimented extensively with cutting out a flat coil spring from acrylic getting all the laser cut lines and this and that's why there are some other bits and pieces going on up here because I did fit it here that would be ideal 
I've tried, I spent hours looking on the internet for a coil spring for clocks and things and you can't get them for love nor money. If you can get them they cost an arm and a leg. It shouldn't be that difficult. It's just this, this is why this project is still not finished. The other reason why it's still not finished is the AM and PM indicator. I remember thinking this looks great, let's just get on with it we'll leave it at that and then thinking oh but AM and PM an excuse for more mechanisms Ooh, mechanisms etc etc and I cannot get it working I have tried well I've designed dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens of design ideas all carefully mapped out and measured and everything else and tons of these models the idea is um, which one's easiest to show you? Uh, well, probably this one. No, oh, actually, it's the other one. The idea is that, make sure I've not got reflections on it. I might be reflecting on it, but not reflections. Anyway, as this lifts up with the snail cam, it pulls this funny sort of leg shaped white lever up with it. That then reaches, and it's not going to work now because I'm it's fallen backwards because I'm holding it up right. Basically as that comes, oh no look, it, if I let this drop again, it turns this round, this cam, funny shaped cam, as it drops back down. And that means it's as it, it reaches 12 or whatever then it comes back to 1 and immediately it changes it to up from IM to PM and vice versa. Because it just suddenly pushes this cam round and then there's little dimples in the outside of the cam to hold it theoretically at AM or PM. It does not work. It works sometimes. And I have tried all sorts of things to get it working. And I think they would look lovely. So I'm going to continue working on that and perhaps either get rid of the AM and PM or find another way of doing it or something. I'll have a dabble with it every now and again. Oh, I think it's time for another dabble now. That's a fantastic job done by the 3D printer. Nothing to do with steampunk, but something to do with a litter picker opera. Here's a litter picker opera, and the end has snapped off. So I've measured it up and printed a new one. Reason being, look at that. Brilliant. I'll glue that in. Reason being, we take our we walk our dog twice a day in the local park, and so much rubbish is being left there currently. It is unbelievable. Well, on average, we manage to pick up five full carrier bagfuls once a day in the morning, and then the following morning another five and another five. I I just don't get the mentality. I don't understand how anyone can think it's okay to have a picnic or whatever over there and leave everything. Talking to a couple of people, local people, they're saying that they've even seen um, the delivery vans turning up. So people order a food delivery and then eat it in the park and leave everything while they found it. Every conceivable human bodily function we have had to deal with the remains of. Unbelievable. Anywho, is a lovely job and I don't want to go anywhere near this end considering what it's been touching look at that I can finally pick up more bits of rubbish Yee. oh one interesting thing to add it's the first time I have done a hundred percent filled print so this is absolutely solid the original one I did snapped I mean it lasted pretty well but it was 25% fill where you get that webbing inside but this is absolutely solid, it's amazing that's going to be so tough another day and I'm getting ready now that the mercury um, models are finished and dry finally the silver paint 24 hours later I can assemble the pendulums, well that pendulum to be precise I'm just checking on the painting of them. I was checking on the finish. I don't know why I didn't do it sooner because what I discovered to my horror, relative horror, was that a number of them have these horrible marks. You can see them really clearly. 
what they're caused by is when this was cut out on the laser cutter sitting that way up on the is it the honeycomb finish I can't remember but the, the wire the, the mesh grid underneath that allows all the fumes to be drawn down it's very thin so that the laser doesn't bounce off too many parts but that's what's caused these little notches as the laser's gone round every time it's hit one of the support bits of metal it's bounced up and made a little indentation now I remembered then if I look at one of the original ones that I cut out you will see there's a beautiful radius around it look at that it's like I've gone round with some sort of router and just routed a beautiful little angle and I remember how I did this I discovered it by accident but another top tip hey thank you very much if you sit your 10 millimeter thick acrylic on a piece of card and I don't suppose it matters what color but I was using white card and it was about 1.2 millimeters thick but I should think any sort of card will do as long as it takes a little bit of while for the laser to burn through it because then it cuts this out perfectly on the normal settings and some of the laser bounces back up and I found it gives this beautiful really regular um, radius around the top of it or the bottom of it so I'd forgotten about that but there you go if you want to cut out some nice big thick or probably thinner bits of acrylic to be honest with you and have this automatic uh, radius put on it a little feature featurette then sit it on pieces of cardboard so what I'm going to do is to sand it because obviously I can't let this poor shoddy craftsmanship mess go out so I've been uh, sanding there's still a few little bits but that's just caused where the paint um, was still in the bottoms of the little pits so I have sanded them and when I actually checked it's appalling quality control and assurance one two three four five six six of them really did need a lot of work so this is the last one I've got to do so I'm going to sand this radius around this front edge looks awful otherwise I can't let that out dear oh dear can you spot the difference Yes, this is now sitting on an old shelf, a nice big thick piece of chipboard covered in melamine, which is good. The reason for that is I wanted to get my hands on this. This is part of an IKEA shelf. Another top tip actually, as it happens, when I first started making the wall mounting machines, I needed a source of nice big bits of pine, proper wood, untreated. So I could cut them down, route an interesting design on the edges and then build the machine on the front and st after staining it and things like that. And I spent quite some time looking for a source of this um, engineered pine I think they call it because if you look at the end, in fact if you look at the front, well you can see it's made up of sections, strips of pine about that wide that are stuck alternately with the growing going one way then the other then one way then the other so overall as it soaks up moisture and tries to warp and bend and twist it sort of rather than doing a really large warp it does lots of little ones and it cancels itself out very clever so in with IKEA I found IKEA was the cheapest place to get it you can if you look at the catalogue online it's, I can't remember what it's called, they're the plain shelves though, untreated wood, which is brilliant. They've solved the problem of giving it strength this way against the grain, because the grain goes that way, so it's very, it won't bend that way, but this way by, angle, by fixing the hanging system, which is a piece of ex, um, injection moulded plastic in a slot at the end, so that gives it some rigidity to keep it fairly stable. Oh look, here we are, I can tell you what it is. Let's have a look at the name. The label's still on it. Well, I don't know. It's a it's a 901-665-76. So there you go. What I need it for though, well the other thing I discovered after a while, after building the first ones for myself, was that it because it's very soft, it's got soft wood it absorbs quite a lot of moisture and after a spell of dry very warm weather it shrinks sufficiently so that if you've got gears and things arranged on it um, it shrinks so much that they start pushing together too tightly and you have to adjust them 
So I stopped using that in favour of thick plywood because that was more stable. But, to cut a very long story short, I can't get to the wood yard and wood deliveries cost a fortune and what I want to do while I'm still waiting for everything to arrive in the post is I want to build some of these some of these stands for the chronographs so that they can become mantel clocks rather than wall hanging. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to mark out um, the bases and then go outside and use the nice big bench saw to cut this up and then maybe even do a little bit of routing. This was the original size of the ones that I did to display the clocks at the steampunk events but Having looked at it, I think I'm going to make it a little bit narrower. I think it would look nicer. Still going to come be that deep just to give it adequate support for the weight of all this hanging forward. Because if you look at the side, it does come forward a nice long way. But I think just a little bit narrower. So I'm going to calculate and I'll get back to you. Oh, and by the way, this is so difficult to prise out. It really is. I think they put glue in it as well. What I found was it is far easier to saw off about 15 millimeters off the air to get rid of this than to try and spend ages prising it, snapping it, cracking it. And even if you successfully get it out, you're still left with the end of the wood with a large deep slot all the way along. So uh, yeah, it's worth just sawing it off. This is a bench saw. It's got a really big, large, sharp blade that spins around in the center. Normally you'd be able to adjust how high and low it goes and also the angle, really versatile tool. But I got this Shepak TS30 which was fairly cheap. I think it was about £300 because I was making lots of speaker cabinets and really needed something better than a bandsaw to cut up pieces of wood accurately. Because this is a cheap version and it's all pressed steel, I found it was completely, well, you couldn't get it to within a millimetre or two of the actual measurement you wanted. The blade was angled, it wouldn't line up properly. So in the end, I took the whole thing to pieces and clamped the blade at this height, whoops, that height, at 90 degrees, packed all this out, did all sorts of other stuff, so it means I can't adjust it, but you can still do an awful lot with uh, a bench saw that's got a vertical blade. So I put the guard over it. Right, so that's okay. I don't remember which one I've cut off, but it cleared the slot, so that's great. So what I'm going to do now is to cut this into 90 millimeter lengths. The other useful thing is when you want to cut something this way, I mean this has, it's quite a clever thing running on bearings, a parallel or 90 degree thing. So I'm going to set this to half the width of that, remembering that the saw cut is four millimetres wide and then I'll cut them out. Finally I'm just going to run it through the sander. Whilst doing that a couple of things have arrived in the post which is very exciting. See what has arrived. Come on! Mm. Ah. ah! That's a sound board. That's the MP3 board. I'm sure this can't have been a dream, me remembering having received one already and then lost, losing it or not being able to find it. Because I remember the, how it was packaged. I remember it was stuck onto the back of the delivery note. Oh, very strange. There it is, in all that packaging, inside the anti-static bag, there's the socket on the back for an SD card, in which to store all the files, the audio files. There's the clever chip that reads them and decodes it into MP3 audio output, or whatever. There's the output socket and the um, power connectors and the two data connectors to control everything from the Arduino. Fabulous, so that's another project I can be getting on with. What on earth could be in here? Let's see. 
Oh, that's nice. I needed, I needed some more paint. Um, and Amazon was the quickest, speediest, and best priced actually. But in order to get enough uh, to get free postage, you have to then spend over this much. But these, this is something I've wanted for ages. It's one of those things I always forget that I need when I don't need it. What they are are, oh, well, there we are. They're magnetic vice jaw. Um, protectors or well the idea being I'll show you here's a vice and here are the jaws and because I was cutting up that copper rod earlier I stuck some masking tape inside the jaws because apologies for the state of all this I must get around to cleaning things regular maintenance not irregular maintenance They've got very rough surfaces so you can grip large chunks of metal. But if you want to use them with wood or something, ooh, this is very exciting. What these mean, because there's two magnets there, so they stick onto the, um, the jaw, the chuck jaw, the vice jaws. And that is fantastic because that means now I've got a lovely, tough, rubberized, plasticky centre bit. So I can now grip delicate objects in here without any fear of them being crushed. Look at that, that's lovely. Because the problem, if I put a piece of copper rod in here and tighten it down, you even not very firmly, but you get these teeth marks digging into it. But this, oh, that's great. I'm really pleased, and I'm so, I don't think they're about nine quid. Very, very pleased with that. It's one of those things, like I say, years, I keep thinking, I need one of them, and now I've got one. Even the internet's not working today. Those lovely people at Virgin who want to be my friend and send me a letter every few months saying, oh, we love you so much, you're so valued, we're going to put the price up because we want to give you even more speed. I wrote back a couple of times and said, I don't want any speed. Five megabytes per second or whatever it was is quite adequate for my needs. I didn't order any more, I don't want to pay for any more. But they put the cost up until I negotiated and haggled and I got the 10 megabits and I don't know what it is now. I think it's something like 100 megabits having paid even more or naught megabits as it is today. Anywho, they're so kind, the people at Virgin Broadband. What my next job is, is to put the twiddly bits on. If you look at this, you can see there's a little routed out shape around there which really does look lovely. The way to do that is to use one of these twiddly bit appliers or a router and a routing a router cutter. You come in all sorts of different shapes and sizes so you can um, cut all sorts of shapes and sizes out of a piece of wood. Um, the idea of a router is a bit like a power drill but very very fast. Forgive this little concoction here, but this is, I've had this router for years, and when I bought it, they didn't worry about dust and things like that, so it didn't have a dust extractor, so I had to make one, which makes it rather awkward to get to the bits, but basically it spins extremely fast. 20, yeah, 20, oh, I don't know, 27,500 RPM or something, I don't know, don't know. Anyway, very fast. So fast that, in fact, um, the wood doesn't have a time time to recover, and this just very nicely, if it's sharp, cuts a, a the shape. And what you do is you move it up and down so you can adjust whereabouts, how deep you want the cut to be, and then you hold it like that, and you go over the piece of material. And if you've got one of this sort of cutter, a bearing following cutter, where you've got a little bearing, I must stop saying little. We've well, got a bearing at the end of the router cutter. This will follow the edge of a piece of material. So if you imagine I'm running this along, it can't cut any further inwards than that guide. So what I'm going to do, I think this is still this cutter I used last time. You see, it's quite a complicated design. It's got an internal curve, a little, little notch, an external curve. I'm going to set this up, and because these pieces of wood are quite small, it will be a pain, I think, to clamp them down because I'd have to clamp the wood down, do half of the routing, unclamp it and do the other half. Well, I don't know. The alternative is to bolt this, screw this upside down, have the cutter sticking up, and then I'm free to hold this and run it along. 
I'll have a think about which I prefer today. Routing causes loads of dust. I can vacuum away some of it. But I was thinking, do I really want to fill the workshop with dust? All these parts just ready to have a nice layer of dust. And I suddenly thought the spray booth. I'd forgotten. I was trying to think before I had something that I'd clamped work onto. And I couldn't think what it was. And I remembered, of course, underneath the um, spray thing, there's an old black and decker workmate. And that's perfectly situated because it's enclosed so the dust, what doesn't get sucked away, will be drawn down that back thing and blown outside. And also, there's one of these dust removers. The original purpose of this is if you're doing dusty work, that cycles through all the air in the workshop collecting all the dust. And then I found the other effect of it was that you get perfectly clean air out the other side to help you remove dust from spray painting. So I'm going to do it over there. One nice feature of my Bosch Gas 25 extractor, which is brilliant, sort of vacuum with a huge filter inside that you can shake like so to clean it, is that you can plug a power tool into it, switch this over to the power tools, and then when you switch the power tool on, it automatically switches the vacuum on. And then when you switch the power tool off, the vacuum keeps going for a few seconds to clear the tubes. It's a really nice feature. All right, moment of truth. I have covered up a few of the, my head orify, my ears and my eyes, because it's very loud and I don't want to risk things flying off into my eyes. So, can I get the goggles and the, yeah, well, Right, moment of truth. Well, that's not too bad. You can see it's a pain because this can twist, but that's pretty good. And uh, the design on that isn't bad at all. That will look absolutely fine. It's quite nice having it like that. So now, because I haven't got anywhere any other way of clamping this. The only way I could do it is to screw a piece of wood underneath and then clamp it in there. If the screw holes lined up with the holes where those two rods are going to come up, that would be quite a good way to do it. I would think. Plan B. Two screws that don't go all the way through. I can then clamp that in there. And that is now really firm. I now know that's not going to move, so I've got much more control going round and round. Not bad at all. Run a bit of glass paper over it, just to take a few fluffy bits off where it's gone a little bit blunt, but that's great. And I can unscrew that. Brilliant. Well, I've got them sanded and everything, they look lovely. I've managed to find in the shambles that is uh, my storage system, I've actually got one, two, three, four, five of those large dowling pieces, six millimet 16 millimetres dowling. Then I had a thought because I'm an idiot. Not because I had a thought, but those more astute members of the watching public, this mantel clock stand has two legs and it supports the clock and I only realised this when I was lying in bed the other night having changed it it supports the clock with two slots that you can put two screws in your wall or you can equally well hang them on these two pillars so what did I do with the new version to streamline it I made one Oh, it's just, it's so ridiculous. So now, I either change this mantel stand to one pillar in the middle, which I don't think will look right. I haven't actually tried it yet. I'll have a think about it. I might sort of mock it up and see if it looks like. Or, somehow, I cut out the other two um, holes, the little slots to hang things on. I just made another discovery. I've just found something unpleasant on one of these pieces of dowel. Scraped it off, there's another bit here. It's baby food. 
What? Well, this, all these pieces of beautiful beach dowel came off one of my children's cots. Seemed such a shame to throw it away or whatever else, and it was too, too damaged and worn out to um, sell to anyone. So I cut all the dowling off. What a pain, because they varnished it. So this is unstainable. I can't stain this. They've got a thin coating of varnish, some sort of matte or satin varnish. So this is useless. I can't use it. What a pain. I can use it to paint with. I could paint it, but I can't actually um, stain it or anything. So I can't get on with this now. Oh, pain. All right, let's put some pendulums together. We get the base. And then we get a chisel, a nice thin chisel. Because I sprayed all this with the brass bay spray paint, the top of the bottom bit, if that makes any sense, is also covered in brass paint. As I've said before, brass paint is great, adheres really well to surfaces, but it's not really strong enough to fix to glue other things to. So wearing the cotton gloves so I don't touch this silver that's so delicate what I'm doing now we've got focus you can now see the bit that goes across which is the inside of that the top of that I've now cleared of paint so we've now got acrylic nice rough acrylic surface I'm gonna put a dob of glue there perhaps a little bit both sides then rest that the mercury and then that's a wobbly so what I'm going to do now is to push not permanently but just while it sets so I want to get that vertical that way and vertical that way there we are ten of the mercury model bits glued in while I think of it, the other good thing about wearing um, cotton gloves, really, really useful top tip, is that super glue responds very, very actively to um, sweat, to oils and greases and things, well, oils from your fingers, your skin, which is why they use it, and I know I've said this before, but it's quite interesting. It's why law enforcement agencies use it to find latent fingerprints on items they put the item in a cabinet fume box put a load of this in and as it sets it releases some chemical that reacts and turns any remotely faint traces of skin oil white which means that you then when you go back to it a few hours later you can see any latent fingerprints bright white with all the lines and curves and things and swirly bits I'll let the mercury rods set really well, give them an hour or two or something, before I think about putting the copper bits in. I don't want to disturb them, I'm just going to leave them there. Thank you very much for watching, and remember the chronograph and all sorts of other very exciting steampunk themed products and inventions are available on my Etsy shop and my website. I'll put both links in the description. Thanks again. Hopefully things will start arriving in the post like clock movement soon so I can slow down with the videos and get on with the making and assembly.